and welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Daniel, and in this video we're going to continue our discussion of solids. We're going to look at the different kinds of solids we can have, whether they're amorphous or the different kinds of crystalline solids that we touched on briefly in the first part of this unit. Um, and then we're also going to talk about conduction in these kinds of solid materials. We can have conducting materials, we can have insulating materials, and then we can have something in between, which is kind of like semiconductors. And then we'll go a lot more into depth about how semiconductors work and why they're important to the electronics industry. So first off, let's, um, let's distinguish between amorphous and crystalline solids. So as we mentioned briefly in the last video, an amorphous solid is one that has no regular or repeating structure. Whereas a crystalline solid, like we looked at a lot in the last video with unit cells, has that repeating kind of lattice structure. So that means we can create a unit cell for it that encompasses the repeating pattern of the unit cell. So if you take a look at the two pictures on the bottom of this slide, you see that on the right side we have this amorphous SiO2. You don't see any kind of regular repeating pattern in the structure. We have a, a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 silicon ring there. We have a 4 silicon ring there. It's all varying within the structure. Whereas if we look on the left side, we see crystalline CIO, SiO2. That we see is made up of these crystalline kind of SiO4 tetrahedra. And we see that there's a regular um, kind of repeating pattern in each. We have hexagons here, so we have six silicons kind of encompassing each of those hexagons. And so that's what we call a crystalline structure because we have that repeating pattern to it. So let's see how it is that we create an amorphous versus a crystalline solid because these are clearly the same compound, but one's crystalline, one's amorphous. So the way we create an amorphous solid, in this case, we're going to call this an amorphous silicate. That's just um, a silicon kind of oxide compound, just a silicate. So when we take crystalline SiO2, crystalline, we'll call it silica SiO2, is heated above its melting point, that's at uh, 1600 degrees Celsius, it'll obviously turn into liquid SiO2. And then we can cool it, if we cool it rapidly below that melting point temperature, there's not really enough time for the atoms to arrange themselves in a crystalline repeating pattern. And so we're left with an amorphous um, substance, this being called glass, in this case uh, quartz glass. So if we, had, if we had cooled this more slowly, we would have gotten crystalline SiO2. So if we get slow cooling, we get a crystal. If we do fast cooling, we'll typically get an amorphous solid. And this is typically the case for any kind of solid as well, although they're not gonna, all going to form glasses. But in general, the quicker you cool a solid from its li or a liquid into a solid, the f more likely you'll get an amorphous solid if you do it more quickly. Since we, we all know what glass is, but we can also add different things into the glass to change its properties. Some of these things we could add are we could add aluminum into the structure, sodium carbonate is another common additive into glass, and boron we can also add into glass. So that's why you have glass for lots of different applications. You can have glass for windows, glass for cookware, glass for heat resistance or light resistance, all these kinds of things. One other thing that we should know is that this amorphous, um, this amorphous solid, we can also think of it as a solution that's extremely viscous. What I mean by that is like, well, first off, viscosity is a measure of how kind of difficult it is to move a solution, how liquid it is. If you look at honey, for example, that's an extremely viscous liquid because it's um, not as free flowing as, let's say, water. So if we took that kind of to an extreme, we'd almost get, we'd get something like glass, where glass is practically an immovable solution. So that's, that's a technical way that we can look at a amorphous solid as a just extremely viscous solution. So we're not going to really talk much more about amorphous solids other than the fact that they can, um, they form these glass kind of materials, extremely viscous kinds of solutions that are solid, and that we form them by cooling things really quickly.
What we've been focusing on, what we're going to continue to focus on, is crystalline solids because we can categorize them by their repeating structures. So there's four kinds of categories in general that we can put any kind of crystalline solid into. So we'll get into those. First off, we have metallic solids. That would just be any kind of elemental metal. So you could have solid, um, I don't know, solid iron, solid sodium, solid vandium. Just any kind of metal on the periodic table will form what's called a metallic solid. So what's important to note about these bonds, the bonds in metals is that they're two things, strong and non-directional. So we know that metals are generally very hard, and that means that they have this very strong kind of bonding between atoms. It's difficult to break them, anything like that. But what do we mean by non-directional? By non-directional, we mean the opposite of directional. So if we take a covalent bond, like a carbon-carbon bond up here, we see that the bond is in kind of one direction. It's between the two atoms. On the other hand, in a metal, as you can see by the little purple aura representation around all of these metal atoms over here, the bonding in metals is non-directional. So it can go all around the, um, each of the metal atoms. So that means that we don't have any kind of directional constraints as we do in a covalent bond, where this is only going between two atoms in particular. So this is the reason why metals are said to conduct heat and electricity uniformly very well in all directions, because of this non-directional bonding in the metal. What this purple aura here represents, and what you see with these negative signs over here, is the simplest model of metal bonding. And that's kind of the model known as the sea of electrons model. If we think about it in very simple terms, we can think of the bonding in a metal as a sea of electrons. What that means is that we have all of these electrons in the structure, all the valence electrons of the metal. In general, they have all these positive nuclei. And so the electrons can travel almost freely throughout the metal, anywhere where they need to go. And this is what gives rise to their excellent heating or um, conductive properties, either of electricity or heat. Since the electrons are so mobile and that there's so many of them, it's simple to um, have the electrons acting as our charge carriers in a metal. That's the most simple way we can look at metal bonding. A more advanced way is something known as the band model. But we'll get into that later in the video once we've talked about all the different crystalline solids. For now, let's go to the ionic solids, which should be pretty familiar with them from the last video. So we know that ionic solids are kept together by the attraction of opposite charges. That's described in Coulomb's law that we went over in general chemistry one. So the positive cations are attracted to the negative anions based on the fact that opposite charges attract one another. And then as for the unit cell here, the, we know that the unit cell is consisting of the negative anions forming the basic unit cell. In this case, we see it's FCC with the uh, chlorines over here. And the reason for that is because anions are generally larger than cations. Since the cations are so small, they can fit into the different holes within the unit cell, as we went into in detail in the first video. And so the hole that they fit into depends on the relative size of the anion to cation. We saw that we had tetrahedral and octahedral holes. And then also the stoichiometry comes into play with filling these holes. So we went over, we went over ionic solids in pretty good detail in the first video, so I'm not going to go further with that here. Anyway, next up we have molecular solids. So molecular solids also have a repeating structure, except that instead of having just an atom at each lattice position, they have a molecule at each lattice position, or lattice region, whatever uh, terminology you want to use. So on the left here, we have, wa we have uh, water as a solid, as ice. So what we see is that this we see this crystal structure forming, except instead of having an atom, like an oxygen or hydrogen in each place, we have an entire water molecule occupying each lattice.